welcome to the Wildly Optimized Wellness Podcast. I am your host, Terea Rodriguez, and I'm joined by the lovely co-host, Evie Tackett. Both of us are functional diagnostic nutrition practitioners, and we love working with women from all over the world through our virtual programs, helping women not only feel better, but actually achieve that vibrant, no holds barred version of themselves they've been missing for a long time. And how we actually get there? Well, that is what this show is all about. Now, please keep in mind that this podcast is created for educational purposes only and should never be used as a replacement for medical diagnosis or treatment. And if you like what you hear today, we would love for you to hit that follow button, leave a review in Apple podcast, share with your friends and keep coming back for more. Let's start today's adventure, shall we? Okay, welcome back to another episode of the Wildly Optimized Wellness Podcast. Today, we're going to talk about movement and how movement is such an important part of wellness in general. But then we're going to kind of spin it on its head a little bit and talk about movement and how it relates to the outdoor environment and why that can be a very critical way of adding to somebody's healing plan or adding to their wellness overall strategy or healing from chronic illness. So we'll definitely touch on all of those points today, but I guess I just want to start out. Evie, when you think of movement, what do you, what comes to mind? Uh, What's movement for you? Movement for me, I want to say moving my body, which sounds so obvious, but I, I also think of strength training, lifting weights, because that's been my thing for the past 10 years. So mm-hmm. when I think of movement immediately, I'm like, oh, strength training, lifting weights. Right. And I've just recently started to shift into movement as so many other things too. So that's kind of, I'm in this transition right now currently myself for my own movement and my own movement strategy and all exactly. of Exactly. And we'll definitely dive into some of those things, but you coined it, right? It's like the first thing we think about is strength training or going on a run or going on a bike ride or doing some form of physical exercise. Because when I grew up, and I'm pretty sure it was the same for you, like when we thought about movement, it was PE class. Yes. Like that was it. It was the physical education class. That's when we got quote unquote exercise. And that is what movement was. And I read a very mind blowing book or mind expanding book many, many years ago when I was dealing with chronic illness. And this was after my practitioner basically told me to hang up the bike for a while. I think we've touched on this in previous episodes, but I used to cycle a lot throughout the week and do a lot of endurance cycling. And when I was told I couldn't use that form of exercise, I was kind of left with, now what? What do I do? Yeah. You know, I can't become a couch potato. Obviously, that would be the wrong response to that. And the suggestion was walking. And that felt very boring to me. Walking. Why would I want to walk? And I stumbled across this book called Move Your DNA by Katie Bowman. And she is a what's considered a biomechanist. And so she studies the way that we move our bodies. And she wrote this book. I want to say it was somewhere around 2010, 2011 when it came out and I was reading it. And what she was explaining was such an amazing way of looking at movement versus exercise and that most of us look at exercise and it's kind of this small little encompassing circle of certain types of exercises, right, that we do to get physical activity but doesn't really look at the whole picture of movement. Like, how are we physically moving our body to get out of bed? How are we bending down into that cabinet to reach the the pot that we need to cook our dinner? You know, those kinds of movements. And she started to look at movement as a much more encompassing circle of which exercise was in the middle and looking at all those different variations of movement and how that was relating to the body. And you said that you were in this transition of being aware of these other movements. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. Like I said, the past 10 years, I've been exclusively strength training. You know, my husband was a strength coach, is a strength coach. Um, And so that's how I met him. He was my personal trainer. And so I fell in love with strength training and just the cool things I felt physically in my body. And when I find something that I like that I 
am good at, I'm going to continue it. And I, I had a lot of su- success with it. So why would I stop? But it wasn't until the past few years that I started working with functional medicine practitioners, holistic health coaches, that I learned about your adrenal health and how, you know, that can impact your uh, Hashimoto's. And then that's also because of things that you're doing daily, right? When I first did my first Dutch and we looked at the cortisol, we looked at my adrenal health and we got a glimpse of that. And it was like, I was really depleted and I was strength training five days a week at that time and doing a few high intensity interval training circuits for a cardio. And when I saw that on paper, I was like, that's why I feel like garbage. (laughs) So it finally clicked for me. And so it's been hard to let go because again, when you like something so much and you feel like it's doing really good for you or it's doing really good things for you, it's hard to stop. Yeah. But in this transition, the more I learn about my own body health and what makes sense for me in this moment of my life, I can't do that anymore. I can't do that level of exercise. And that's really hard for me to admit, but I have to accept it because my body does tend to do better with lower amounts of strength training throughout the week, you know, still doing it, but I'm much better with the intensity. I'm exploring things like walking more. Like I've gotten really into walking. I do that every morning. I try and do it throughout the day, little 10 minute bursts of walks. I'll do lighter type of cardio instead of like doing sprints or jump rope every time. I will do things like elliptical or walking or something like that just to change it up. So that's been my progression. And it mainly stemmed from finally accepting that part of the reason I felt like garbage was because of what I was doing for my own movement and being really stuck in that mindset of it has to be this way because it has been all these years. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the transition that I'm going through and learning to accept and let go and finding really cool things to do that are just as challenging, but they're not as intense. And so you get just the same amount of benefit, but I'm not burning myself into the ground by doing that. And one of the things that Katie would argue about doing it in that way of doing the strength training a certain number of weeks and doing the hit cycles a couple of times a week and do it, repeating those same movements over and over is that you are only expressing a certain range of motion in your body as opposed to all the possible ranges in the body. And she talks a, about this interesting concept in this book in how our environment has shaped the way that we move. Mm-hmm. And so she talks about the butt to chair ratio in your house. If you have ever like stopped to think about that for a minute, how many butts live in your house and how many chairs or seating places or resting places do they have? <laughs> it's quite embarrassing. Actually, right? right. There's dining yeah. room tables, people who there's can't... stools, there's right. office chairs, there's beds and couches and a beanbag maybe or whatever. Like there's a lot of places for the body to be at rest and be in that same geometric shape, right? And the same kind of thing, like if we're on the treadmill all the time, right? That treadmill is a different type of moving the body and the muscles and the legs compared to walking outside. And most people are like, well, it's walking, walking's walking. But her argument is that the belt is already in motion. So our legs aren't actually pushing backwards to propel us forwards nearly as much as when we are out walking on the street. So it's still different. And so the body's reaction to that is very different. And so that was one of her arguments is really paying attention to how much of this motion are we doing? And these movement behaviors that we do are on repeat and not really expressing the full range of movement that we have available. Yeah, it's so true. It's so true. We That made me think of There's like these memes that I've seen over the years of, you know, why do you drive to a gym to walk on a treadmill? You know, it's kind of funny of like, we could just be doing this outside, you know, most of us, right? Or some of us, it depends on where you live. But ideally, you're, you're getting this free exercise, free movement, free medicine, right outside your door. So I often think about that of, and part of the transition too. I want to go back to that, because maybe this can resonate with someone who's listening. But Um, I've gotten along with getting out of the mindset of it has to be in a gym. I've been doing a lot of outdoor workouts the past uh, really year, year and a half of if it's nice out again, I'm in Cincinnati, I'm in the Midwest. So anytime it's nice out, I'm going to take advantage of it. And we have a bunch of stuff here at home, like a garage gym, essentially. And so I'll load up my car. And, which is a workout itself, right? I will load yep. up my car with all the weights and the barbells and all that. And I will take it to a local park and I'll just work out in the grass barefoot. And it feels amazing. And that to me feels much more intuitive 
movement than going in the gym and doing these things basically up and down, up and down, or walking on the treadmill or doing this. So that's been really cool too. Is and I think we're going to get into that of how to how to do more movement that is more natural and intuitive for the body and how you can actually challenge your body in this way. And so I just thought that was something to mention because that's part of me transitioning out of being in such a box, literally working out in the gym and then realizing like, well, it feels better to be outside and this feels more natural and this feels more in season. And so I want to do that. So that's been really cool for me to experience and see the changes in my workouts. Even if I don't do the exact workout I plan to do in the um, in the gym, if I do something completely different outside, it's still effective and it feels really good. So that's hopefully what, you know, more people are starting to think of and pick up on as well. It's cool that you use that as an example, because right then and there, you're taking your um, kettlebell or whatever it is. Instead of like picking it up off of the ground and starting to do kettlebell swings, you're literally picking it up, schlepping it out to the car, lifting it probably higher to get it into your trunk than you would normally, you know, so you're using your body in a much different way, Yeah, which is the variety that is really key and changing it up is part of what she, her concept is, is getting that movement variety. So just like we have, well, most of us have an emphasis on nutrition variety, right? You want to get optimal nutrition, get a lot of variety of fruits and vegetables and legumes and different kinds of meats. And don't be in this like chicken, broccoli, coconut oil rut all the time. Like you want to make sure that you're getting this variety. The same thing is happening with movement. And that's where for me, it ties into the outdoors really nicely because when we're in a natural environment, we're not on a treadmill that's going to move in the same way all the time. We're, you know, reacting to the environment. It invites us to do other kinds of movements, especially if we're not on pavement and we're on natural grass, like bumpy, lumpy grass, or, you know, walking on a trail that has very different terrain on it. That's going to invite a whole different style of movement than if we were just walking to and from our car or to, you know, to and from the living room and back to the office or whatever that happens to be. Like working from home has been a challenge for me because I want to try and vary up my movement. So even though I record in this room, I don't work in this room all the time. I'm constantly changing where sometimes I'm in the kitchen, sometimes I'm sitting on the floor you know, those kinds of things so that I can change up the movement all the time. Yeah, definitely. I, I become a lot more aware of that. I, I was in the mindset again. It's, it's just funny to reflect back on the version of Evie before I knew you and, you know, obviously here today and I would work all day. And then I would say that, um, you know, I would go to the gym for like an hour and I was like, oh, there's my movement, but I wasn't active outside of working. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, right. um, I was a teacher, so I was moving around a bit during the day, but I was also, um, I was an intervention specialist. So that means that I didn't have my own class all the time. So sometimes I'd be sitting in the back of a room working one-on-one with a student. So it wasn't like I was moving around as much as someone else. And so it was like, I just thought, well, I, of course I moved today. I went to the gym for an hour, but it's like, there's so much more movement outside of that, that I wasn't getting. And so now I, that's why I place an emphasis. If I have a 10 minute break somewhere, I will go outside. I have a stop sign. That's perfectly to walk there and walk back. It's about eight to 10 minutes, depending how fast I go. Perfect. And that's my little landmark that I'm like, okay, I'm going to do my 10 minute break, get my brain a break, give my eyes a break from the screen, get some sunlight. So that's been huge too. And it, it does make such a difference to do that. It feels much more natural. Again, I think that's the theme I'm kind of coming up with in this episode of this feels so much more natural to me than what I was doing in that rigid mindset that I have. Cause it was also giving me a rigid body. I was a lot more stiff back then too. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's interesting because there's a whole movement of people in the exercise space or natural movement space that are focusing on exactly that natural movement, right? So getting people used to squatting. Again, we didn't used to have so many places to park our butts comfortably, right? Maybe a log, but usually you're squatting. Um, So squatting and walking and climbing up things, climbing up trees, climbing up rocks, those kinds of things as a way to produce physical fitness that is beyond the lifting of the weights and doing the bench presses and doing the cycling miles and all of those different things keep us in that same repetitive movement. So by us, you know, looking towards natural movement 
that helps our whole fitness regime change, which then you know can play into roles into our cellular health. And then we'll get into that in a little bit later, but that kind of natural movement is one of those things that inspires me to get outside because when I'm outside, that's when I'm responding in a way that feels like natural movement. Yeah. I yeah. Agree. So being in, in those kinds of terrains for me anyway, is really important. So when I do a walk, for example, you've got your stop sign and back, right? I've mapped out a couple different neighborhood walks that are all uniquely different in their terrain. So one might be going up and down stairs or one might be going down you know, the street and then finding some patches of dirt or grass that I'm walking on instead of it always being the sidewalk. You know, I don't want to be uh, doing the same thing over and over and over again. And so that's when I'm looking for the outdoors to kind of guide me when I'm looking for natural movement and that kind of variety. Yeah. And one thing you said that made me think of my, uh, so I have three nephews, my littlest one, he's almost two and watching him squat I'm like, we knew, like, we know how to do it. We we were made that Dang, way. Like, right? like they, those yeah. babies, they have the best squat form. And it's just funny because we do fall so far from it. So uh, with a lot of episodes that we've recorded and that we talk about with clients, it's, it's always getting back to the way we were supposed to be living, the way we were supposed to be eating, the way we were supposed to be moving. Cause I just think of that, like we start out doing that perfectly. Like the squat is so good on little kids and the the distribution of weight is perfect, right? They're not like aching, their, their knees aren't hurting. Like they're doing it properly. Their hips are open up the right way, but we tend to fall so far away from that. And I think a lot of this is because we fall away from that dynamic movement that we've been talking about. Absolutely. I worked with a uh, movement coach for a while and one of the exercises that we ended up working on, so I worked with him for a good I would say 12 to 14 months. Wow. And we didn't start here. Yeah. We started with the foot, like moving my big toe off the floor. Like that's where we started. But where we ended was really working on my squat skills. And I was like, oh, I know how to squat. And he's like, all right, squat. And then I would immediately fall over, you know? So it's like, oh, apparently I'm not like your nephew. And I can't just sit in a squat for an extended period of time. Like they can play with their toys in a squat for a long period of time, adults usually can maybe get into a squat position, but they can't get their heels down. You know, there's not a lot of balance there. So we have to work at those skills again. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's these natural movements that we used to do when we weren't surrounded by an environment that kept us in like limited motion, Mm -hmm. so to speak. Like she'll look at the houses and the cars and the buildings and all of those things as further examples of us limiting our motion. She also talks a lot about this other definition. And this is something that really piqued my interest and got me interested more in this kind of movement, which is mechanotransduction. And mechanotransduction is basically, it's the way that our cells interpret the mechanical inputs that come from our movement And our cells will interpret that and it will use these integrins. And integrins are these membrane-spanning globular proteins. So it's a protein that will span through the cell membrane, right? So these, these integrins will interpret that mechanical movement from our movement and actually change the way our DNA expresses. So the moment she said that, I was like, oh, light bulbs went off okay, how we move is just as important in the way that our genes express themselves. So our epigenetics, right? Our environment helps us express our genes. So we talk a lot about how our food does this, how environmental toxins do this, you know, all of these different kinds of things. But also the mechanical movement helps us express ourselves in a different way. And that was something that really helped me understand that, oh, how we move, especially if we're trying to heal from a chronic illness and we might not be able to lift weights or go ride a bike for 10 miles, you know, if we're not in that space, we can still get just as much of a bonus from the way that we move within our homes to help ourselves regenerate and express the DNA differently. 
Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Uh, that makes a lot of sense, actually. Again, everything's connected and that would that would make sense that it would influence us in that way just based on our movement and the way that we're switching yeah. it up. And if you think about it from a biomechanical standpoint, right, when you put your foot on the ground, that pressure that gets elicited on your foot itself then leads towards the ankle. The ankle is going to make its own accommodations or adjustments to how it's interpreting that movement, which then leads to your knee and then your hip. And then, you know, it goes all the way up the chain from a physical standpoint, but then it goes intracellularly too. And this is one of the reasons why she talks about varied terrain and having things be not the same so that we can stimulate the cells in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Hopefully that makes sense. Yes, it does. Yeah. I'm interested in this. It's, oh, it's, <laughs> it's fascinating, fascinating book. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's one of the reasons why when I'm standing here recording this with you and you see me shifting my weight, it's because there's a mat underneath me that has different elevations. Like it's got bumps and things on it so that I'm physically moving all the time as opposed to just standing still. Right. So have you heard the term standing is the new smoking? Yeah. Yes. Right. Because we all were like, oh, yeah. we can't sit all day long. Let's get standing desks and stand all day long. Right. So now we're standing, but we're standing in a fixed position. So our knees are locked and our feet are flat and our elbows are, you know, perfectly 90 degrees because somebody came and did an ergonomics review of your desk. So it's perfect. Right. And you're not right. moving from that. Right. But it, really what is important is constantly shifting and constantly moving and having that be different, which is part of the reason why my movement coach started with the feet. We started with just yeah. rehabilitating so the important. feet because that was the basis. And then we started improving the form of my walk. And for months, he had me walking backwards. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's so much there. I've learned a lot about the feet. There's actually, um, I think she's fairly popular, a physical therapist uh, in her social media page and probably her website. I'm not for sure, but it's called Gate Happens. Ooh, fun. And she's all about feet all about feet and how because again that's so foundational no pun intended to your to your movement and your body but yeah i mean you're right on the feet is so important or the feet are so important in the way that they move and because then you said goes to their ankles and the knees and the hips and walking backwards actually really interesting too i know that that can alleviate some back pain for some people especially if they're maybe doing like a backward sled pull because you're kind of restructuring the way that your body is moving instead of like having a, a certain tilt when you're walking forward, you have a different tilt when you walk backwards. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes that can alleviate some pain. So that's really cool that you were doing that with your- Yeah. I mean, for our purpose, we were working on knee rehabilitation. So I had an old knee injury that caused a lot of compensations throughout my body over the years. And we were trying to rehabilitate that overcompensation. So the knee is long since healed. Yeah, There's no injury there. There hasn't been for decades, but my body compensated in a way and basically kept this overcompensation going. And that would lead towards other problems, lower back pain, et cetera, et cetera. So we were really working on rehabilitating the knee. And one of the best ways to do that is to go backwards because your brain doesn't think about walking backwards in the same way as it does walking forwards. So we were basically re, I guess you could think about it as lighting up the areas of the brain, thinking about motion in a backwards direction allowed the brain to identify, oh, there's alignment here that I didn't think was here before. Yeah. And then I was able to get that to be rehabilitated by going forward. So kind of fascinating stuff with how the brain works and the movement works with the cellular pieces of it and how we can heal using motion in a way that's just very different than exercise. Right, right. Right. One other thing that she was talking about is the way that, well, Katie, she, and my movement coach both talk about this a lot is the way that our feet are restricted inside shoes. Right. I used to, I used to wear heels a lot and elevated boots, like heeled boots and stuff. And of course, I was realizing that that's probably one of the worst things to do for my feet because I'm like shoving my toes and crowding my toes. But the way that Katie describes it is that the shoe restricts our movement and keeps us doing maybe 
10% of the foot's ability to adapt to the environment around it. And so how that works is that forces the ankle to overcompensate and do all the work, right? And so her description of that really got me to understand, oh, if I quote unquote free up my feet a little bit, and start learning how to walk barefoot on the grass or, you know, just really allow my feet to start moving in response to the environment and the earth underneath them, that that will change the way that my feet are able to do their job that they were designed to do over centuries and millennia, right? But yeah, it changes the feet altogether. Yeah, the feet, I've gotten so fascinated by that. There's a lot of barefoot type shoes out there. Over the summertime, I bought a pair of Vivos and they were my first pair because I was always a little, honestly, self-conscious with my feet because I felt like my toes were on top of each other. So people who aren't watching the video won't see, but I felt like my toes were always kind of crowding each other and my baby toe and the the fourth toe were always kind of jammed and kind of curled up on each other. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, oh, that just must be the way that I am. Or also years of squatting, right? Talking about my history of squatting so much and probably me trying to grip the ground. I would like curl my toes in to try and grip the ground a little bit for my footing when I was squatting. And so a lot of theories, right? I don't know exactly what's there, but I also know that I was wearing tight shoes. I mean, think of yeah. flats, right? When those came in, those little ballerina flats and just high heels in general. And most women's shoes are very narrow. And really, if you think back, like we've talked about, the human foot should, the toes should be spread apart. There should be some gaps in between. You should be able to, you should have an arch to your foot. Your foot should not be narrow. And we're seeing that there's other issues throughout the body when your feet are like this. And so mm -hmm. I decided, you know what, I'll give it a try. I'll do these Vivo barefoots. I bought them. And so that was in August. I know it was August. I it was my first time wearing them. And I have two pairs now. And I primarily wear those. I also stopped wearing tight slippers in the house because I used to do that. So now I'm more barefoot or with just socks that aren't tight in the house. And it's so funny this week, I realized I looked down at my feet and I was like, oh, I have, I have space between my toes. I what? It's amazing. Like, this is actually yeah. working. Yeah, this is actually working. And it's funny because I also don't feel like I have as much tightness in my foot and or in my hips. And that could be for an, a whole bunch of other reasons. But I have to think that something's related to the way that my foot is working better and moving better because it's not so jammed and cramped up in the shoe. Um, so that's really cool to see my feet actually expand and I talked to someone who he walks barefoot a lot, um, even like in the forest, like he will literally go ground and do all that stuff. And it's a pretty impressive. And he said that his shoe size has changed since where be going barefoot. Yeah. Right. He, he's actually it's actually gone down because his foot isn't so narrow anymore and pointing forward. So it's almost like his foot has gone has gotten shorter because it's now spread out. Yeah. So I thought that was really, really interesting. And I believe it now seeing my toes not jammed on top of each other. I don't, I guess I won't have to be so, uh, so self-conscious yeah, about you it. You know, it's so fascinating because I worked with David a lot on just the, the foot itself, like that we probably spent the first month just working on the feet and the toes and how the toes work. And one of the things he said to me is, you know, let's make sure that you've got a wide enough toe box so that your toes have that space, that movement, uh, the, the room to move, right? They weren't moving just yet, right? So it felt like things were flopping around, but then eventually what ended up happening for me is that I gained a shoe size. And if you think about it, it's because I would always have these much smaller shoes, either too narrow or too pointed in the toe, like, like you were saying. I looked at my old cycling shoes not too long ago. I used to ride, clip, they call them clipless pedals, but you're actually clipped onto the pedals. So you've got these special shoes that click into the pedals. And I looked at those shoes. They're so tight and so narrow, right? That no wonder I had a size six shoe. And now I wear a size seven shoe. And my you can physically see like my toes have completely widened out. My feet have widened out. And David gives me thumbs up for the way my feet look. And I'm just like, yeah, but they're kind of duck feet. He's like, yeah, but that's exactly what you want, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So now I is. have to sell some cycling shoes because I can't put my foot in there. Like I can't fit in those shoes anymore. So it's, it's quite interesting. Yeah. Your feet, ankles, hips, they're happier for it. So much happier. So 
I guess some of the takeaways that I want listeners to have by listening to this episode is, number one, movement doesn't have to be restricted to just exercise. Start really thinking about the diversity of the type of movement that you're doing, even within your own home, and trying to vary it up as much as possible. So pay attention to those kinds of things. And also the concept of the more natural movement we can get and let the outdoors inspire you to have that natural movement. So if you see a tree, go try climbing it. When was the last time you climbed a tree? It's harder than you think, right? Yeah. Um, it's not like doing a pull-up in the gym. But the more that we try and do those things and interact with our natural environment, automatically we're getting natural movement and automatically we're getting diversity in our movement nutrition, so to speak, to borrow Katie's term, movement nutrition. Yeah, So I love yeah. it. Great advice. I'm cool. Now I'm challenged to go try and climb a tree. Awesome. <laughs> Let's go do it. We'll hang some trees. I think I'm going to do it. I'm just curious what it's going to be like. Cool. So if anybody who's listening, you went out and climbed a tree, let us know and we'll see you in the next episode. Hey, thanks for joining us for this episode of the Wildly Optimized Wellness Podcast. If you are ready to dig deeper into your health, stop playing the wackest symptom game, start testing to get better guidance, you can find more about Terea at tereyarodriguez.com and you can find Evie at holisticallyrestored.com. Want to peek into what it's like to work with us? Come join us at our optimized wellness community. You can find the invitation link in the show notes below. And if you have a question for the show, you can submit your question under the podcast section of TereaRodriguez.com. Finally, if you found something helpful in this episode, don't forget to leave a review, hit that follow button, or share it with a friend. They're going to love that you thought of them. Until next time, see you outside. See you outside.